Um, hi, so as Rob said, my name is Veronique and I am a registered nurse. Um, obviously, I work at Diversa Health and today I am incredibly excited and proud to share with you the results of this study, which is just a few weeks away from publication in a peer-reviewed journal, Australian Clinical Evidence for Type 2 Diabetes Remission. So Diversa Health is an Australia-wide remote care medical and coaching service. We started as the low-carb clinic approaching seven years ago, and we're now a team of 10. We have worked with more than 2,000 people to um, help them adopt a low-carb diet. But our primary goal is to provide the option of diabetes remission for the more than 1 million Australians living with type 2 diabetes. So in this study, the CSIRO have evaluated Diverse's healthcare practitioner delivered low carb program. And the whole thing was made possible by a CSIRO kickstart initiative and a lot of work from the CSIRO team. So I really want to acknowledge the work of Grant Brinkworth and Tom Weishley, I'm sorry if I pronounce that wrong, um, as well as the Diversa Health team. And it was presented at the Australasian Diabetes Congress in August of this year and is on track for publication. So I don't think I need to convince anyone in this crowd that low carb is a helpful intervention, especially for diabetes. But as we were reminded yesterday in James Mukey's talk, it is the evidence that we really as a collective produce that will support change amongst government and policymakers. Uh, so Diversa is certainly not the only service publishing on programs about diabetes remission, Verda in the US, um, pioneering the evidence base for ketogenic diets and their continuous remote medical care, Dr. Unwen in the UK, and programs focus on calorie restriction and meal replacements like the direct trial. And then there's all of you, low carb GPs and practitioners right here at this conference with a similar focus. So really this CSIRO study means that what all of us have been doing in Australia, it means that our work gets a spot on this map. So my disclosures, obviously I work for Diversa Health, I was involved in collecting some of the data, but Diversa did not play a role in analysing that data. I will, however, share some additional graphs based on data I did analyse myself. You'll be able to see on the slides which one they are. But I also have a really strong personal bias um, because I'm a nurse in the hospital system and I've dressed non-healing diabetic foot ulcers and I've changed out bags of dialysis fluid for my patients with diabetes-induced kidney disease. And I've given my patients with type 2 diabetes injections of insulin and then top them up with meals and snacks that look like this. 123 grams of carbohydrate right there. And just like all of you, I can't unsee the impact that a low carb diet has on blood sugars. So I really want low carb to be an option for every Australian living with diabetes. This study was a single arm interventional analysis. That means that everybody in the group was given the same therapy, the diverse intervention, and then followed over time to observe their response. This kind of study has limitations. There's no control arm. You're not able to distinguish between the effects of treatment, a placebo effect, or the effect of natural history. However, the natural history of type 2 diabetes is quite well understood, often referred to as a chronic and progressive condition. So despite these limitations, I believe the data will speak for itself. It's also important to note that the patients in this study made the choice to work with Diversa Health and they paid for this care. So potentially they were more motivated or engaged. Lastly, our patients do not work with us for a prescribed period of time. For the biochemical arm, the study included any patients who had more than two pathology results at least 30 days apart and the data set runs until mid 2021. So some of these patients will have worked with us for three months, some for three years, and some will still be ongoing today. So a lot of data, but I think it's really important to keep in context that this is about real people behind the data. So I'd like to introduce Hal and Sabine. They joined Diversa in December 2021, and they both have type 2 diabetes. Sabine's HbA1c when she joined was 12.4. That equates to her average blood glucose being about 17. When Hal joined Diversa, his HbA1c was 14, and that puts his average blood glucose as, at just under 20. Really high and alarming numbers, but just by looking at them, you wouldn't know. They wouldn't stand out from the next person walking along the street. 
At our first consult, Hal told me his goals, his why. He told me that they had friends with type 2 diabetes who had had limbs amputated, nasty wound infections, friends who had died as a result of diabetes. But there was something else. Hal and Sabine, they have this beautiful 11-year-old daughter. And Hal told me he needed to make these changes to his health so he could have some hope of being around to see his daughter get married. We'll check back on Hal and Sabine later. So Cyrus' study analysed the effect of the Diversa intervention on patients, so what exactly sets Diversa's approach apart? Firstly, it's a personalised approach and support, allowing our doctors and coaching team, along with the patients, to navigate the individual and often complex lifestyle and medical needs with tailored support. What I mean by that is that we're there for the person when they need it, providing real-time support. When a patient has a concern or a question, they know it will be addressed by someone in our team. One of our health coaches, myself, our dietitians, they have a direct line with the doctors. Secondly, it's a ketogenic approach with an emphasis on protein. That is carbs less than 30 grams, whole, um, whole food animal-based proteins as nutrient dense and filling, and intermittent fasting to help moderate dietary intake. Lastly, it's lifestyle and mindset coaching for sustainable change. It's not all about food, sleep, stress, movement, and teaching our patients to tune into their bodies and hunger signals. We've seen that it's critical to think beyond uh, just what am I eating to why am I eating and how am I living. Our method is underpinned by a range of tactical levers that can be mix mixed and matched according to the needs of the patient, specifically targeted resources, online community with education, motivation and masterclasses, text or instant messenger support and regular medical reviews. So our goal is remission, so what does that mean? It used to be that reversal was the main language, but now we're more often hearing about remission with consensus supporting the use of remission in the context of type two. So the definition that we've gone with is, the Australia, uh, is a Diabetes Australia definition, which matches the ADA's definition. That is, remission is achieved when a person has a HbA1c below 6.5%, the diagnostic cutoff for type two diabetes, and remains below 6.5% for more than three months in the absence of any medications for diabetes, including the absence of metformin. So Verda, who are really leading in this space, they use both the terms remission without medication, but also reversal. Reversal being where a person has a HbA1c less than 6.5, but they might still be taking metformin. So remission, no medication, reversal still with metformin. But because this is about humans and not just numbers, it's important to keep in mind that even in the absence of technical remission, HbA1c reduction of any amount is crucial to improving health outcomes for people with type 2 diabetes. So, the results. Uh, first, we'll look at HbA1c. So, the study observed that patients with type 2 diabetes experienced an average reduction in their HbA1c of 1.4% over the seven months, as an average. You can see that at three months, the HbA1c dropped a little more and then comes back up. A slight rebound, expected and consistent with other interventions, which we'll look at in the next slides. So, for context, where I work, a HbA1c reduction of 0.3 is generally considered a clinically meaningful reduction to reduce the long-term diabetes-related complications. But this is more than four times that. Uh, thanks to this graph from Verda, which really helps to put the results of this study in a global context. So at seven months, I'm really proud to say that our HbA1c reduction is comparable with the big global studies. This graph is dietary interventions, including really low calorie approaches. Um, and what we found with patients who try low calorie before is there can be this rebound, which is what you see in purple with the wing data. But also there is normally at least a slight rebound across all dietary interventions. And since the mean duration of the diverse intervention was just seven months, this time frame was likely not adequate to see the full expected rebound in results as yet, but we're certainly keen to continue the work. Uh, remission, the fun one. So what you're seeing here is the 48 people in the study with type 2 diabetes. So this study found that 90% of people lowered their HbA1c. Nine out of 10, 
which confirms what you all already know, that decreasing the glycemic load in your diet can decrease your average blood glucose level. And to most people in this room, that is a really obvious statement, but it's something that the rest of the non-low-carb world really needs to take notice of. Such a simple intervention, and in 90% of cases, an effective way to lower your glucose. Moving along the journey to remission, I'm so proud to say that nearly half of our patients reversed their diabetes. That means that they might still be on metformin, but all other medications for diabetes gone and better blood results. Now, diabetes remission, no medication for at least three months, 27%, more than a quarter. These people in green, they don't have type two diabetes anymore. <laughs> um, so this table is from Diabetes Australia, comparing the growing evidence base on dietary interventions for type 2 diabetes remission. A lot going on here. Um, so I want to point out the green and the orange circles. So it's really interesting to note that Verta and Diversa offering different programs and, of course, really different study designs. But there seems to be a similar degree of success with Verda's drug-free remission rate at one year being 25%. And the mean HbA1c reduction is also really similar. So that's just more confirmation for, for all of you, for all of us. When multiple studies have the same results, it's confirmation of the true effect of an intervention. And so I hope you all share in this result and feel you can own this result too, because we've got an Australian study now that says that remission is possible. Um, up next, medication for diabetes. <clears throat> so within our population of patients uh, with type 2 diabetes, 80% had a medication reduced or deprescribed. So that means lower risk of medication associated side effects and also reducing the adverse effects of polypharmacy as these people move into older age. Um, so here we're looking at the overall medication bur burden of the population by medication dosages. So I'm not a doctor, which means I can't pronounce the names of these diabetes drugs. Um, but we have amazing doctors on our team um, focusing on deprescribing and de-escalating medications. So their approach is first to focus on the highest risk medications. And the most eliminated medications were insulin. SGLT2 inhibitors and sulfonylureas. I have no idea. Um, but as you can see, about two thirds of the doses of these medications were completely deprescribed and an additional 10 to 15% lowered. So for insulin, that's 86% of doses that was entirely eliminated or dose reduced at seven months. And again, it's a really similar number to Verda's one year results where they had 93% of insulin doses being ceased or decreased. Um, and as you'll see, the medications that were continued the most or even added were the GLP-1 agonists, DDP-4, and metformin. Um, and in many cases, these patients will have been de-escalated from the higher risk medications. So to explain this further, our, at Diversa, our docs would say that supporting someone with diabetes is not just about treating the main symptom of diabetes, which is the high blood glucose, but about not worsening the disease, which is that underlying insulin resistance. And so these are the three medications that would be considered by our doctors as the most beneficial or the least harmful in terms of the disease process of diabetes. So as opposed to the medications in the first part of the table um, that carry greater risk, to name a few, insulin-induced hypoglycemia, as well as the need to prescribe increasing doses of insulin to overcome the worsening insulin resistance caused by the medication itself. Um, and the same is true for the sulfonylureas, which work by promoting the pancreas to release more insulin, again, perpetuating the disease process of insulin resistance. And while um, we still certainly de-prescribe this second set of meds as appropriate, you, would, you wouldn't expect to see the green bars as high. <laughs> Up next, we'll look at weight loss. Um, so the first point I want to highlight um, is the first part of this chart where we can see a significant downward shift across class three, two, and one obesity. And the more obese, the greater the result. And then the second thing I wanna highlight is that these two bottom bars are longer because more people are traveling away from obesity down towards either normal or overweight. Uh, lipids. 
Um, so the results are as you would expect, consistent with other low carb studies, triglycerides have gone down, HDL has come up, and we've got lots of um, access to lots of great information about LDL changes um, and low carb through this conference. So overall, I'd just say this is trending towards a more optimal cardiovascular risk profile and indicative of reversing metabolic disease. Our lucky last is liver function. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the most common cause of liver disease in Australia. And you can see that the diverse intervention was an effective way to reverse fatty liver, as seen by a reduction in the markers of liver damage. Again, indicative of a reversal of the underlying metabolic disease in type 2 diabetes. Okay, so you're probably wondering what happened to Hal and Sabine. Low carb, keto, intermittent fasting, medical reviews, group sessions, online community. This is how Hal and Sabine brought it to life for them. And you will correctly notice that it is mostly meat. Nine months in and Sabine has more than halved her HbA1c. Not only that, but she's maintaining these changes despite ceasing trulicity, which is a really powerful medication for diabetes. <laughs> so far, Sabine has lost more than 15 kilograms. She's back at her wedding weight, the weight she hasn't been at for 17 years, all the while her bloods are improving. How about Hal? So Hal's HbA1c has gone from 14 to just 6.1 three months off Trulicity. But here's something even better for you. At our six month consult here, Hal told me that he had updated his goals. He still wanted to be there to see his daughter get married. But now, now Hal told me he was gonna be there to see his grandchildren get married. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Which means that for Hal and Sabine, type two diabetes is no longer a life sentence. They can see the option of remission in their future. It's a journey, it requires support, but it is possible. And we've got all this evidence from right here in Australia to show that now. So where to from here? We've done this single arm interventional analysis and we know there's hope for the 1.2 million Australians living with type two diabetes. We're super keen to continue this research and we're super keen to connect with anybody else interested in doing um, research in this space. Thank you for listening.